Well, hello everyone and welcome to our Sunday morning service. It's great to have you here. A special welcome to uh, everybody who's joining us online from uh, overseas. We love having you here and joining us with us in, in our worship service online this morning. I want to begin by reading from uh, Proverbs chapter 7 and verses 1 through to 4. It reads as follows. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your kinsman. These are wonderful words. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to pause now and praise you and give you thanks. Father, you embody wisdom. You embody all of the goodness that uh, we can enjoy. And so, Father, as we uh, sit and reflect on these words from Proverbs, Father, we realise that true wisdom comes in the worship of your Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only name under heaven under, by whom uh, we can be saved. And so we praise him and we thank you for him. And Father, we, we remember that during the days of Jesus' flesh, that he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his devoutness. And although he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and being perfected he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, being des designated by you, Father, as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And when he, became as, when he came as high priest of the good things that have come, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with hands, that is to say, not part of this creation, not through the blood of goats, or calves, or bulls, or sheep, or any other such thing, but through his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, and having obtained this, having achieved this, he obtained eternal redemption for all. Father, we thank you for these things. In Christ's name, amen. So I'd like to uh, continue on with our uh, reading for this morning. I'm going to be reading the uh, Old Testament reading, uh, which is from Genesis chapter 17, going from 1 through to 16 inclusive. And then I'm going to, uh, going to invite my brother Ben to come up and give us the, uh, the New Testament reading. Genesis chapter 17, rather, and verses 1 through to 16. The story of Abram and the circumcision, the sign of the covenant. When Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and, blame, and be blameless so that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell upon his face and God spoke with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant shall be with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Your name shall no longer be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you a nation, and kings shall go out from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and between your offspring after you throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant to be as God for you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land in which you are living as an alien, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting property, and I will be to them as God. And God said to Abraham, Now as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and also with your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of their foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
and at eight days of age you shall yourselves circumcise every male belonging to your generations and the servant born in your house and the one bought from any foreigner who is not from your offspring. You must certainly circumcise the servant born in your house and the one bought with your money and my covenant shall be with your flesh as an everlasting covenant. And as for any uncircumcised male who has not circumcised the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, for Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her. Moreover, I give to you from her a son, and I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations." Kings of peoples shall come from her. And that's the end of verse 16. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, my brother Ben up for the New Testament reading. Thanks, Ben. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful verse. And uh, now I'll add to it by reading from Mark 8, uh, 31 to 38. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the world, whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when it comes, when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. And this is the New Testament reading, the word of the Lord. Uh, And we'll get Johnson up to find out what message he has to add to these. Thank you, Johnson. Good morning to you all, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God for giving us this opportunity to hear the word of God from the two readings from Genesis 17 verses 1 to 16 and Mark chapter 8 verse 31 to 38. Uh, From these two readings I have come up with a theme. If we kept our contract with God, if we kept our contract with God, or if we kept our covenant with God, One day, a man went to his son's room and knocked on the door. John, wake up. It is time for you to go to school. From inside, the answer came back. I don't want to go to school. Dad, the father was persistent, knocked again and again and said, you must go to school. The answer came back again. I don't want to go to school. Why not? Ask the father. There are three reasons came to the reply. First, I find school boring. Second, the kids are teasing me terribly. Third, I simply hate school. Then the father responded, you have given me three reasons for not going to school. I will give you three that say you must attend school. First, it is your duty. Second, you are 45 years old. Third, you are the principal, so you need to go. This story is found in Jesuit Father Anton Demolog's book, Awareness, which suggests the problem we often sometimes have with meeting our commitments to others, to work, and even to God. Sometimes we are too busy, and on another occasion we are too tired to meet our commitments. There are times, as well, if we are honest, when we simply are lazy or see no value in what we are asked to do. There are even those occasions when people are hostile to their responsibilities and openly reject their duties. We are asked to do many things, tasks and responsibilities, which in some ways are contractual. These duties 
may be formal or informal, written or verbal, understood or acknowledged or assumed, but when they are not completed, there are general consequences to pay. We are all familiar with contracts. A contract is an agreement between at least two different parties in which each person or group agrees to perform a certain task, pay a certain amount of money or provide a certain service that is needed by the other party. Contracts come in many different forms, but the most formal kind is a written document. Most of us have a contract for the place we live, a mortgage, a rental agreement. We agree to pay a certain amount of money each month and in return the contractor of the home or the other apartment owner is to provide a residence. So we use contracts when we purchase most high price items, including cars, electronic equipment. Most of us have a contract or two with certain credit card companies. There is another form of contract which is more subtle, but certainly more common and generally more important than any written agreement. Verbal contracts are made all the time, where we realize it is or not. And these are very significant, for they are used every day of our lives. Married people live under a contract made the day they profess their vows to each other. Couples promise fidelity, love, honor, and companionship until the day they die. Each time we promise to pick up someone, meet a person at a designated spot, run an errand, or visit a sick relative or a friend, we've made a verbal contract. We usually do not think of these daily occurrences as contracts, but most assuredly there are agreements where at least two parties are counting on each other. Contracts that work well save all concerns. But those that are broken are problematic for those involved. So the consequences of for failure in contracts differ depending on the nature of agreement. If we fail to make our house or car payment, there may be a period of grace. But ultimately, the item upon which we owe money will be taken away, repossessed, and we will lose both the item and the investment. So, because the consequences of failure in written contracts are high, people are generally faithful to these agreements. They always even pay in time. So, the consequences of failure in a verbal agreement do not on the surface appear to be that great. And thus, the incidence of non compliance are so high. If we fail a friend or a family member, the result of maybe some frustration, anger, or even a temporary parting of a company, but somehow the severity of what we have done does not register with us. The consequences do not appear to be problematic. So on this second Sunday in Lent, our first lesson describes a special contract or covenant made between God and Abraham, an agreement that was the basis of a relationship between the Lord and the Hebrew people. So the book of Genesis actually represents two versions of the covenant, as we recall it does with the creation story, written by two of what scripts, uh, scholars call the four Old Testament written traditions, namely the Yahwist, the priestly tradition. In chapter 15 of Genesis, we read the Yahwist version of the Great Covenant, written most probably in the 10th century BC, and emphasizing the role of the tribe of Judah in the Hebrew community. In this version, Abraham, being warned of the future bondage of his people in a strange land, that prediction of the community's trial in Egypt is promised descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. So today's lesson, the second of the great covenant stories, comes from the priestly tradition of the Hebrew scriptures. Written about 500 BC, emphasizing the Hebrew tradition in a well-ordered prose, Abraham, as in the earlier covenant version, is promised multiple generations is a unilateral pact between God and God's people. Here, God extends the promise to succeeding generations, and the patriarch seals the agreement with the promise of circumcision for all male descendants. So, the priestly author also has the important detail that both Abraham and Sarai have their names changed after the covenant is made. Scholars suggest that this signifies a change in life or a function for the bearer. It also indicated a turning point in one's life. So the relation between God and God's people, the Hebrews, was from henceforward different. 
Each party agreed to be faithful to the other. Each was to uphold its end of the agreement. So we know by faith and history that God was and is ever faithful on his part. But unfortunately, the same could not be said of Israel, nor for the matter of the Gentiles, the inheritors of the great promise. Let it should be a time to revisit and reevaluate our commitments, promises, contracts in all aspects of our lives. So the Christian community, collectively or individually, has made a significant contract with God through the sacrament of baptism. So this contract was sealed when, for most of us, our parents, grandparents, speaking on our behalf, told the minister or priest who administered the sacrament that we believed in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in the life and the mission of the Christian community, the church. So as children, we might not have known of this special contract, but as we mature and gain knowledge, it becomes binding on the Christian to learn the nature of the pact made between the individual and God make certain our half of the agreement is fulfilled. And now we know that we are part of the agreement. So God and the Christian community have always been faithful in upholding their end of the contract. God is ever present in our lives, patiently listening, leading and guiding, and sometimes challenging and cudgeling us in an effort to push us towards the goal of our eternal reward with the Lord. Because that is the end zone. We at times may think that God is not listening, and caring or asleep on the job, but such can never be the case. We remember well the prophet said, can a woman forget a nursing child? Or show no compassion for the child of a womb? Even these may forget, yet I will never forget you. Isaiah 49, verse 15. So God provides the leadership and points the way through the church. And we are asking to follow. So the Christian community provides with the sacraments as moments of God's grace and special presence in our lives. We have the wonderful gift of the community's proximity in our lives, supporting and assisting. Yes, the time challenging us to be all we can be in the eyes of the Lord. God and the community of the faith have met their com commitments to us. Yes, we've been as faithful to God and the church. Yes, we've been faithful since, since the day we were baptized. And you said, I'm going to be part of this church. I'm going to be part of the Christian community. Yes, you've been faithful to you your baptism. The Christian life gives us many privileges, but there are significant responsibilities that we must meet in order to uphold our end of the contract with God. So the most basic element of our agreement with God is something I suspect most of us don't think much about. We are called to be holy. So we have a common vocation to holiness. Every Christian is supposed to be holy. Members of the Christian community participate in many varied and general multiple vocations. Some are called to the vocation of married state, others to the single life, or others are still in the Roman Catholic tradition to the celebrity of religious life. This, however, is only the most basic avenue of life, vocation. There are many other sub-vocations in which we participate. Many people are called to the vocation of parenthood. All of us have some occupation, the daily work we do. In this light, we may have the vocation of professional service as a physician, an attorney, an engineer, a teacher. We may have the vocation of greater direct service as in sales, ministry in the church, or outreach to the poor and destitute in, in, in the world. Some are called to more individual vocations in offices, clerical workers, writers, and computer operators and programmers. Regardless of our state in life and the day-to-day -day work we perform, all Christians are called to live lives of holiness. Wherever you are, it is our basic and common vocation and one we can never let slide. I was talking to someone and he was saying, Johnson, you know, business and church ethics are different. When I'm doing my business, I mean business. I said, brother, whether you are doing business or you are at church is the same thing. You are a Christian in your business, you are a Christian at church. So you don't change because you are at your business. Some people who are good in leadership at church, the way they handle even their workers is not good. It doesn't show any sign of being a Christian. So when we forget or disregard this most best element of our relationship with God, we have failed in our fulfilling our end of the contract with the consequence that we become estranged from God and the community of faith. 
So the contract will be broken and its benefits for both parties can be lost. So our contract with God goes beyond the basic requirement for holiness. We are called to hear the Lord's voice and respond to his call. Follow me. That is what he said. So discipleship is the second step in the common response of God's people to the one who first loved us. If we read Mark chapter 8 verse 34 and 35, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Can you see these ways? We simply cannot bury our heads in the sand like the proverbial ostrich and think that God will not see us. That the Christian community will not miss our presence. So discipleship is not an option. It is a requirement of our contract. Our baptism, our promise made it to God. Being a true follower of Jesus is not a passive endeavor, but rather requires our active participation. We need to participate somehow. We often wish to place limits or attach special requirements to our active discipleship. But the former Lutheran pastor, theologian, and writer, Dietrich Bunhofer, told us in this book, The Cost of Discipleship, that being a true follower of Jesus will cost us everything, even our life. That's what it means. That's why if you go on in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, it goes on like this. What good is it for men to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So to have power or financial control over the entire world system of Satan as the head of it, but to lose eternal life with God. That's what it means. No amount of money, power or status can buy back a lost soul. No matter how rich you are, with the billions in your account, when you die without Christ, you are going to hell. Full stop. And that's it. You can't purchase your soul back. So we cannot make compromise with the Lord and say, I'll be your disciple tomorrow, but I'm too busy or not of the right mind today. You can't say that. Such an attitude suggests an on-again, off-again agreement with God, but this cannot be for the true and loyal disciple. You are not on and off. You are on every day. 24-7, you are called to be Jesus' disciple. So we therefore cannot take an attitude of partial participation. We can either follow Jesus all the way or leave the road somewhere along the journey. The choice is ours. Yet we know because we have been promised where the journey will end. St. Paul reminds us, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, he says those words. So the requirements for discipleship are multiple and can be subsumed under the idea of faithfulness. But during the great season of Lent, the concept of service to God's people might well be emphasized. We are called to minister to God's people in little and great ways. If we have the time and energy and opportunity to serve the poor in some sort of volunteer service, such as soup kitchen, homeless shelter, or a free community help, this would be a great response to the core of discipleship and Satan would make a great strife in upholding our end of the contract with God. We may have the opportunity to visit a sick neighbor or a relative or possibly assist a needy person next door with some routine household task. Our service need not to be pointed out, but might always even also need it within our own families. Sometimes we even forget our own children because we are also too busy with other things outside. Sometimes we become so wrapped up in the needs of others and we forget at least gloss over our duty of service to those we know and love. Our children, maybe our own wives, our own husbands. Children can do lots to help out around the house. Parents can make special efforts to spend more time with their children. Families in general can spend greater quantity and quality time together. This might out seem like service. It might even appear to be self-saving, but how can we master sufficient strength? And that's why I've even seen that at times when we are having Easter, a lot of families come together. When we are having Christmas, a lot of families come together. This is the time where also they are building their relationship. 
And I urge you to so, so that we are building this for you to be good disciples and ministers to others if you cannot gain strength from the basic unit of our common human experience. So strengthening family life and fostering its membership is eternal service and most certainly is appreciated by God because we love our brothers and sisters. We love our own family members. So the Holy Season of Land provides the Christian community with the opportunity to renew and strengthen the main contracts we have made with people. In most all cases, these are verbal agreements, and that's the one that might slip because the ramifications of our failures in such contracts will not result in the repossession of a material item at the loss of a job. I have heard a lot of people who fall into relationship, but because they are not married, they spend almost 10 years in a relationship. Then someone dumped someone there, and I've heard so many people crying, you've wasted my time. It's because they've carried on for these 10 years, hoping that something is going to happen. If he had seen that the relationship is not going to come up, why didn't you stop it at an early stage? One year, not ten years. You've wasted someone's time. But because that person cannot take you to any court, because it was just a verbal agreement, but you have, in a way, killed someone's heart. You have destroyed someone. Yet our verbal contract, especially those made to God, are the most important, because they are signed, not, even not on paper, but on our hearts and are thus of great significance. When you say, I love God, there's no way you have signed. It's a, an agreement between you and God. And that is very important. And we take it to say, yes, this person said, now he's a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why we baptize people, because they've confirmed and confessed their faith. Then is a time for spouses to recommit themselves to each other. So marriage is a verbal conduct of commitment and love them that needs to be fostered and renewed on a regular basis. Those who have chosen the marriage vocation and family have the obligation to revitalize this most basic human unit. We can also take the time to reflect on upon how we are to recommit ourselves in our place of work. Even a place of work. Some people are just working because for the sake of working. They don't like what they are doing. Why would you stay at a job where you don't like it for more than 10, 20, 20 years? What is the purpose of being there? At times, our day-to-day -day job may become so routine and dull that we don't want to continue. We need to ask ourselves what we can do to put more spark into this daily task so that we will faithful and completely maintain our end of the agreement we have made with our employer. So the most important contract renewal we must make is our agreement with God and God's people. So in conclusion, leaving our baptismal commitment fully as holy and committed people, Following Jesus as true disciples is absolutely necessary. It is not an option. Through the tradition, Lent and practice of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we have the opportunity to renew and strengthen our contract with God. We can renew it. We, we at times may not feel like meeting our commitments. We may even feel like running away. But such an attitude is inconsistent with our Christian life and demonstrates no trust with God who is ever faithful always present and ready to renew his side of the bargain. So God is always there. When you made the commitment to say, now I want to follow you, he listened and is now waiting for you to recommit to what you say. As members of the Christian community, we have responsibilities that in many ways contractual, but are not even written form. As God made a contract with Abraham, sealing it with a change of name to Abraham and the practice of circumcision, so we have a contract with the Lord sealed with our baptismal commitment to live holy lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. That is now what we have been called. So during this London season, let us renew our relationship with the many people with whom we have contracts within our family, places of work, and most especially with God and God's people in the church. Do you know that there are contracts within the family? When you represent the family as the father, when you represent the family as a child, it's a contract. Take your contract very seriously. Let us be faithful to what we proclaim. It is Jesus' kingdom we preach, build, and we wait. It is the Lord's life of holiness and faith we seek to emulate today and to turn our life. So I just want to urge you, brothers and sisters, to uphold your contract. If we kept our contract with God, it's up to you. If you kept your contract with God, Sometimes we forget that we have made a contract with God. If we kept our contract in our marriages, when we say, till death do us part, is it by death 
that the contract is terminated or is because of other things. May the good Lord help us to remain focused on the contract that we have made. And the contract is said, till death do us part. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. I will call my brother Chris to come and end the service. Thank you, uh, Johnson, for that uh, powerful word, um, something that we should really consider very, uh, uh, very carefully in the season of Lent as we consider our relationship with God and, uh, and what he has done for us, where he's taking us, and our commitment, our part in, in that process. We need to uh, think about that regularly, not just really at the season of Lent, but all year round. But uh, thank you, Johnson, for a reminder, a very good reminder for this time of year. So um, as we conclude the service, I just want to uh, remind, excuse me, remind everyone that uh, uh, if you have the means to be able to give to this work of God here in this place, uh, particularly if you're a member of this church, uh, please remember to support us financially because uh, that's the only way we can continue is by having the finances in order to, uh, to fund this, uh, this work, including this online ministry that we do now. And so I'd encourage those who uh, are members of this church or those who are in Australia who are watching this message, uh, you'll see a slide at the end of this message giving you the bank details. If you would please contribute, that'd be just wonderful. So thank you and let's pray. Father, we're just mindful that uh, all gifts and all resources come from you and uh, nothing we have uh, doesn't ultimately belong to you, and we are stewards of this. Father, I just pray that you would work in the hearts and minds of your people to, to give appropriately as you lead them to in order to support what you are doing. We are your humble servants. We have no, uh, no real authority or gifting of our own other than that which you have already given to us. And so we thank you for this, and we pray that we will be good stewards of it. And we pray that you'll multiply our gifts and uh, bless your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. And so as we finish up, I'd like to um, read something, and I'm going to then pray, and then I'm going to actually uh, use it as a form of benediction. So I'm reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and this particular uh, passage is actually used often as a, as a benediction at the end of a service. But I'm going to read through this first and then I'm going to pray and then I'm going to use this as a benediction following on. So starting with verse 11, it, Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Now I'm going to stop right there and say, why would we rejoice? Well, we would rejoice because we have the word of God. We have the redemption that comes in Jesus Christ. Johnson has just preached to us about this covenant relationship with, we have with God. This gives us reason to rejoice because God is faithful and he will see that covenant through. We just need to do our part and be faithful to that covenant also. So we have good cause to rejoice. So it just goes on and says, be restored. Be restored, be encouraged, be in agreement, be at peace. All of these things are gifts that come to us upon faithful commitment to this covenant, not because we've earned it, not because we uh, earn anything by these things, but because we do it out of love and God blesses us with our response. So we will find peace when we are in, at peace with God. And it finally says, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And that is something we can truly rely upon and be grateful for. So let's pray and then I'll continue on with the rest of the benediction. Father, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for your holy word. It is through your word that uh, your spirit works in us to divide soul and spirit, to be able to work out the intentions of our heart. Father, we pray that you would gift us with a soft hearts, hearts of surrender hearts of attentiveness to the gifts that you have given us through Jesus Christ our Lord, hearts that are willing to repent, hearts that are willing to change, hearts that really commit to the whole uh, concept, the whole ethos of this Lenten season in which we review our life in you and recommit ourselves to that. 
So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of being called by your name, and we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and the redemption that we have through him. And we thank you in his name. Amen. So let me continue with the benediction. This is also in 2 Corinthians 13, which says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I'll add, now and forever. Amen. Bless you all. Have a lovely week.